Hello, readers. Douglas France is a former managing editor with the LA Times and shared a Pulitzer Prize as a foreign correspondent for the New York Times. Catherine Collins was a reporter and foreign correspondent at the Chicago Tribune, as well as a contributor for the New York Times and LA Times, before leaving journalism to become a private investigator specializing in international financial fraud. Together, they are a husband and wife and co-authors of several nonfiction books. The newest will hopefully be considered one of the top books of the year by the end of 2022. It's called Salmon Wars, the Dark Underbelly of our favorite fish. Doug, Catherine, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? We're doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We're really happy to be with you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. So Catherine, we'll start with you here. What was the genesis of the idea for this book? Well, there are really two ways to answer that question. Um, It may seem like an odd subject for us. Neither one of us is a fly fisherman, an angler. Neither one of us is a marine biologist or even an environmentalist. But we think that, or we hope that, our readers will be people just like us, people looking for a uh, healthy and sustainable way to fill our dinner plates. But um, that said, we do have some connections to this subject. My father was an avid fly fisherman. Uh, He loved it the way some people love golf. And uh, growing up, he'd come home from fishing trips with big piles of wild caught Atlantic salmon, and that's what we ate at every single special meal in our household. My kids, our kids have never known that pleasure. And then um, about 20 years ago, they moved back to Nova Scotia 30 years ago and uh, saw a small fish farm going in not far from their their cove. And at first dad was really excited. He thought, wow, this technology, this new development may be the answer to saving wild Atlantic salmon. A few years later, he knew that wasn't going to work. The technology was flawed. He went out with a friend uh, and with a glass bottom boat and could see that the seabed below had been destroyed by this little farm. And so we, so we, I'm sorry, Trey. So we had that concern in the back of our minds for 30 years or so. And when we moved home to Nova Scotia, um, we heard about a plan for 20 more of these huge fish farms. And they're really huge floating industrialized feedlots to come to be planted along the coast of Nova Scotia. There was a public meeting not far far from our house in January, 2020. And we went up just to hear. And what we heard was was worrisome to say the least. We heard from environmental experts, from fishermen, from lobster fishers about the damage to the environment and the threat to wild salmon from these fish farms. And so we did what we've done our whole careers we investigated, we, we began working on this book. And for anybody reading this book, you find out pretty early on a scary comparison to what the salmon farming industry is. You call it a combination of big tobacco and big ag. Why is that, Doug? Well, partly it's the, the, the comparison to big agriculture is that salmon farming on the, these are feedlots sit on, sitting on the ocean along coastlines, often along salmon, wild salmon migration routes. And over the years, over the past two decades especially, they've grown from small mom and pop operations to giant industrialized feedlots that are hyper intensive, just like big agriculture, just like cattle feedlots, just like barns that hold 100,000 chickens. And life is pretty darn miserable for the chickens in those barns, for the cattle in the feedlot, and certainly for the salmon jammed into these small cages. And so that's the comparison to big agriculture. You know, it's, it's prof, this is a profit-driven business run by half a dozen or maybe a dozen multinational corporations that are driven only, only by profit, though they wrap themselves in this uh, cloth of feeding the world. The comparison to big tobacco is that over the years, it's been known since 2004 or so, there was a landmark study that showed that farmed Atlantic salmon in these, in these, in these open net salmon farms are higher in toxic contaminants like PCBs than wild salmon. And therefore, there's enough accumulation of residue that they're dangerous for your health. But the industry has spent the past two decades covering that up, trying to discredit that science exactly the way big tobacco suppressed for many, many years 
that smoking was dangerous for your health. We're not saying, Trey, that eating farmed salmon is as dangerous as smoking, but we are saying in this book, Salmon Wars, that the science tells you you should be wary, you should be careful, and the science tells us it damages the environment. But most consumers just don't know that, and that's why we've written this book. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's the case also, Catherine, when you're talking specifically about salmon that has been labeled farmed salmon and just go to the grocery store. It's next to impossible to find something that is described as wild caught. And on the one hand, I guess they're at least being a little bit earnest about that part of the process. But considering how much of our seafood is raised on farms now, especially when you're talking about salmon, it has a wide ranging impact on on just about every single piece of that fish that Americans eat. And that's true. And, you know, we lived in Paris for a few years and we'd go to the fishmonger and we could see where the fish was raised, what it was fed, how it was harvested. It was very clearly labeled. So, so we know that it can be done. And we know that this country can do, do much better. It was the, uh, the FDA in a recent uh, list of inspections did what was it, Doug? 89 inspections for 379,000 tons of seafood. That just isn't sufficient. I mean, the government is not protecting you here for about the safety and the use of chemicals and other residues and contaminants in these fish. They're not protecting you. And the labeling on this fish is likely to say just, just fresh Atlantic salmon. Oftentimes it doesn't say that it's farmed. Never does it tell you how it was raised, what chemicals were used. One of the things we advocate for in this book is something like a QR code on the labels that you could flash your smartphone on and you could see where it was raised, what kind of chemicals they use. You know, that's just necessary consumer education and no government has been willing to, to adopt that kind of regulation yet for farmed Atlantic salmon or for other aquaculture, really. It's akin to nutritional labels on packaged goods. It's such an obvious thing in this day and age, even though that is a flawed process in its own right, it's better than what it used to be 20 and 30 years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that those are the standards that should be applied to farmed Atlantic salmon. And now, if you're a consumer and you wanna eat wisely, if you wanna help protect the environment and protect your health and the health of your children, you don't have much option when you go to the seafood counter or the restaurant. One of the places that we have found is most reputable and probably works about the best in a kind of flawed system is the Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch. They publish a guide online, which anybody can access online, um, and they warn you about, about farmed Atlantic salmon. Most of it they recommend not eating because of the chemicals and because of the disease. No, but that requires some action on the part of the consumer. And, and we shouldn't have to worry that way. Yeah, unfortunately we do though. And much like with the modern medical system here in the US, it's uh, up to the individual to really take charge of their own well-being. Now, Catherine, evidence of fish farms can be found as far back as 3000 BC in China. Modern salmon farming began in Germany in the mid 1700s. Where and how did commercial salmon farming really get its start? Pardon me? Oh, yeah, I know. Um, the, uh, you're right. It did start 3,000 years ago in, in China. And they, at that point, they were trapping carp and putting them in little ponds. And then uh, the industrial part, industrial development, really started with the Norwegians, although the Norwegians relied on an American geneticist uh, by the name of Dr. Lush. And he developed a way to grow, to grow salmon, only Atlantic salmon. They're the ones that are, are particularly suited to this process. He developed a plan in order to grow them faster and uh, larger. And, the, and two Norwegians took this technology back to Norway in the 1970s. And that was really the beginning of salmon farming on an industrial scale. And that's the point at which you begin to see the problems with the sea lice infestations and the chemical buildup on the seabed. And salmon farming had been done prior to that also on a very small scale, a few hundred fish kept in a, in a pen. And that went on for 200 years. It's from the 1970s on that you see the real problems begin. And Canada really took to open that salmon farming in the early 1980s. Was the Canadian government at all cautious in helping this industry grow? 
On the contrary, Trey, um, the <laughs> Canadian government encouraged the creation of salmon farms, and they did it, I think, probably out of, out of a, a, a good motive. At that time, the wild salmon stocks in the a lot around the world were beginning to diminish. Their habitats had been destroyed by mills, by dams, by deforestation, by spraying DDT. Um, and you know, so they were looking for a way to protect those wild fisheries. And so they embraced the idea of salmon farming in the late 80s, early 90s. Same time, Kathy's dad saw it as a way to protect the wild salmon by reducing pressure on the fisheries. Unfortunately, the consequences were far dire. We created a new man-made threat to the wild salmon and a threat that also damages marine life around these pens. And they went from a few hundred fish in the early 70s and mid 70s. And now you have a salmon farm where you'll have 12, up to 12, 14, 16 cages with up to a million salmon in a single farm. And they're, they're locked into a cage that's about 650 to 60 feet deep, anchored to the ocean bed, floating on the surface. And the, they'll have 100,000 or more fish in a single cage. And it's like, it's like what PETA, the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, compared the space in a salmon farm cage to having 27 full-size salmon in your bathtub. And that's not a recipe for healthy fish or a healthy environment. No, it's not. I mean, just think about a human being confined to a small amount of space. You are not going to be a very healthy version of yourself, much less when you're talking about wild animals that do need that freedom of movement to keep them from having that on top of the wretched diet that is being fed this fish. It's just, if nothing else, creates a very unhealthy meat. I mean, you know, even what you, before you even start talking about some of the chemicals that these fish are being are, are consuming in order to be fattened up properly, just the amount of cortisol that is being released in their systems, it creates a meat that is uh, untenable if you are really breaking it down when looking and comparing it to uh, the wild version of that same fish, Catherine. That's that's true. The, the feed ratio is improving slightly, but when salmon farms first took off, it took about three pounds of wild fish to create the fish meal and fish oil to raise one pound of salmon. Now that has improved considerably in recent years, but it still takes more wild fish to raise a pound of salmon. And um, where you see this impact most clearly is off the west coast of Africa, the, the 3,400 um, miles of coastline there. And that's where you see so many trawlers coming from other countries in order to uh, scoop up tons and tons of these wild fish. And basically you're taking, what is it, 40% of those, those trawlers are operating illegally mm -hmm. right. and half of the fisheries are near collapse. And what you're doing is taking fish from those people, people who use this fishery in order to survive. You're taking it from the plates of people on the west coast of Africa in order to feed our salmon in a non-sustainable way so we can eat it in our fancy restaurants in Europe and, and North America. There are various turning points over the last uh, 35 plus years now that have uh, really helped this industry to evolve in all the wrong ways. Doug, what was the turning point in the evolution of salmon farms in 1987 perpetuated by hydro seafood in Norway? I don't know. Hmm? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, it was really interesting. That was when a Norwegian, the richest man in Norway, although by then I think he'd transferred his citizenship to Cyprus, a man named John Fredriksen, who was an oil tanker tycoon during the Iran-Iraq war. He was one of the few people in the world who was taking oil from Iran in his tankers and selling it on the world market. He got his eye on salmon farming. And what he saw was an opportunity to take a pretty middling business at that point and grow it into something huge. And he brought it, came in there and he used hydro to buy up a whole bunch of smaller firms. And he created a, a salmon giant called at that time, Marine Harvest. Now it's called Maui ASA and it dominates the world's salmon market. And what's happened is interesting Trey because in Norway, the salmon farming 
operations had gotten so big that the Norwegians, late but eventually, were concerned about the impact on wild salmon, concerned about the impact on their fjords. And so they started charging these firms a lot more money to lease land, to lease um, water rights where they could grow their farms. And so what happened was Maui and Cermak and Grieg and the other Norwegians started looking for other places around the world where the regulations were not so strict. And so they landed here in Canada, where we live now. They landed out in Washington state on the west coast of the US and they landed in British Columbia. And so they brought their problems here, but they found the governments were not attuned to it and, and still don't regulate it very effectively. It's, it's, in, it's interesting, as far back as 1990, a Norwegian member of parliament explained the influx of these com companies coming to Canada by saying that they were very strict in Norway uh, about both the quality and the environmental issues, and therefore their fish farmers were looking for more forgiving environments. And he, he told the Canadians, he came right out and said that the Norwegians were looking to build bigger farms where they could do exactly what they wanted. Unfortunately, no one on this side paid much attention and took the warning. Catherine, 15 to 20 percent of farm salmon die each year, a number that may reach as much as 100 million fish. Much of that number succumbs to something called sea lice. What are sea lice and what is the very unappetizing sounding sea lice soup? <laughs> Google sea lice, <laughs> but not before you eat a meal. Um, <laughs> uh, the industry will tell you occur naturally in the environment. And if you ask my father, he'd say, oh, yes, I'd see them every once in a while. And you just flick them off with a fingernail. The problem is in the wild, a sea lice will uh, fall off because of the currents or damage a fish and he'll die. It, within a farm, you get so many fish confined to such a small space with so little movement that the infants infestations can become so dire that they, they are attracted to the mucus in the salmon and they, they will eat his face or his fins and eventually kill him. We, we spoke to a, a, a woman in Newfoundland who used to work in a fish processing plant who described using a shock vac to remove the sea lice uh, before processing the fish. And the uh, other second, second problem with the sea lice is they're not confined to the cages. They also spread out in this sea lice soup that you mentioned. It's like a plume and they go outside the cages. And because these cages are located often on salmon, wild salmon migration routes, they attack the salmon that are migrating past. And this is particularly risky and dangerous and potentially very lethal for the young salmon, the smolts that are coming down out of the river to move into the salt water of the ocean to feed. And so you have them killing literally hundreds of thousands of farm salmon, but they're also damaging the few remaining wild salmon. Doug, speaking of escaping these open net farms, some fam uh, salmon actually do escape these open net farms, making it back into the wild. Now, that might be okay if this were a Disney movie, but it's not. This is real life. So why is that such a bad thing? Well, it's, it's a bad thing because the farmed fish here on the Atlantic side of Canada and the Atlantic side of the United States, those farmed fish are not bred to exist in the wild. All those natural instincts are gone, and so they're weaker when they're released, and they interbreed with the wild salmon, and what they do is create a hybrid fish that is unable to survive in the wild. They also compete with the few remaining wild fish for food and for habitat. And so they're damaging the wild fish that way. There was a, a study up in, in Newfoundland. They studied, the Canadian government studied 18 salmon rivers and they found 17 of them contained these hybrid fish that were, were, were you know, well, they were a hybrid and they're too weak to survive. And so you're, you're taking a keystone species, the wild salmon, and you're making it even harder for it to avoid extinction. Catherine, what is cypermethrin and why is it important in the story that y'all are telling? Well, that takes you back to sea lice. Cypermethrin is a, a neurotoxin that's banned from, for use in this country near any marine environment because it is completely lethal to crustaceans, lobsters, shrimp, that sort of thing. And uh, in, in uh, Glenn Cook's farms in the Bay of Fundy, he was having a sea lice problem. 
and it came to light as the lobstermen began to notice that their lobsters were dying. We spoke with a, a man by the name of Brian Green, who went out to pick up his last shipment of or last load of lobster at the end of the season. They keep them in what they call lobster cars and found that they were barely moving. They were behaving very strangely. So he brought it back into shore and took it to Environment Canada and they, they began to do an investigation and tested these, these lobsters and discovered they had been uh, exposed to cipermethrin, as had a number of salmon of uh, lobster uh, cars. cars, thank you, in the area. So the investigation went on for about two years, Doug, and it turned out that this chemical had been imported by Cook Aquaculture from uh, the States through the Bay of Funday on, in jerry cans on, on fishing boats. And uh, it was a rare instance in which a uh, CEO of a company was charged with, uh, faced criminal charges for the use of this stuff. And not only Glenn Cook, but two of his chief, two of his executives were charged and they faced up to three years in prison and the company faced $30 million worth of fines. Unfortunately, um, they settled. Uh, Cook and his uh, colleagues didn't appear in court and uh, the fine was, their, their charges were dismissed. The company paid only $500,000 worth of fine, uh, which is just a slap on the wrist for such a huge company. And they were able to use, direct some of that money to fund a chair at a university for further study of aquaculture. And um, then the court records were sealed. And so this, the story never became public. There were small stories in the press, but, but the true impact of this was never revealed. Well, and the full impact is finally revealed in our book, Salmon Wars. <laughs> we have a really interesting chapter in there called Poisoning Your Backyard. And we, we got those sealed documents and they, they tell a, 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 a story of ignoring the consequences of using this neurotoxin to protect your fish because of that and the damage that it created around those salmon farms and or the lobster crates rather was was really devastating well what is some of that additional damage beyond the obvious well cipermethrin and other chemicals and pesticides used in the salmon farms to fight sea lice and other plagues and diseases and viruses will accumulate below the farms. We have, we, we, we have a photograph, we found a photograph on the internet here in Nova Scotia below a single salmon farm. Some divers had gone down and stuck a yardstick in this toxic stew below the salmon farm. It's this bubbling, awful mess of stew, and it went in the stew up to the 32 inch mark. And what that does is that stew steals the oxygen from all the surrounding area. The, the impact is carried out by the water column and the impact can go for 600, 800 meters. And you know, it's just, it's, it's damages the lobsters. It's, it, it damages the seabed. It kills the eelgrass, which are part of the ecosystem and it kills scallops and shrimp and all kinds of other things. So you do highlight plenty of uh, villains in this world in your book, including Glenn Cook, of course. You do also uh, share the details of some of the heroic figures who are really trying to bring this information to light. That includes somebody by the name of Alexandra Morton. Who is Alexandra Morton, Doug? Alex Morton is really the godmother of the resistance worldwide to salmon farming, to open net salmon farming. She's, she's, she's a marine biologist who lives in Puget, just off Puget Sound in British Columbia um, on the west coast of Canada. And she has fought for about 30 years now to protect the coast and to protect wild fish and wild mammals from the impact of these farms. She wrote, she, wrote a, she wrote a great book by a memoir that came out recently called Not On My Watch. And she, she's a fascinating character. And she lived out there for many, many years alone, raised her son after her, after her husband died in a freak diving accident. But she's been committed to this. And Alex has spawned a, a larger resistance movement that is occurring in British Columbia, in Washington, 
Washington State down the coast. She worked very closely with people there when they used the collapse of a, of a salmon farm in Puget Sound in 2017 to pass a law banning open net salmon farming in Washington State. She's working very hard to get them banned in British Columbia, and the Canadian government is moving close to that. But her reach has been worldwide, and she's one of the really colorful, as you say, heroic characters who populate this book. I mean, we tried to take the story of the salmon, and it, the salmon is, is the hero here. The salmon is the central narrative line of the book, but we have a lot of colorful and, and really inspiring mm -hmm. characters along the way. Yeah, Don Staniford is uh, another one of those characters. People just need to read the book, find out more about Don. Now, you uh, state the case that the supposed health benefits of salmon are far outweighed by the risks, especially when you're talking about farm salmon. Sadly, that info has been out there for everyone else to see, too. As you mentioned a little bit earlier in this conversation, there was a major study that began to expose the dangers of farmed salmon that was published in the journal Science back in early 2004. What exactly did this research uh, try and tell people back in 2004? It was warning. It tried to warn people about the levels of PCBs and other, other contaminants uh, in farmed salmon. And the study found that farm salmon came, contained up to uh, 10 times as much cancer-causing chemicals than the wild fish did. And what was interesting was how the industry responded to this. They, um, the, the, new, the press responded very quickly. CNN had a headline saying, you know, farm-raised salmon is more toxic. Scotsman said eating farm salmon raises the risk of cancer. But my favorite was the New York Post, which said salmon slamming studies as farm fish are foul. <laughs> the industry responded <clears throat> by doing their own research and countering, countering this one. And one of their, uh, their defenses was that they accused the funders of the study, Q, uh, uh, which is of course the nonprofit research body, with having an anti-pollution agenda. Can you tell me who has a pro-pollution agenda? It seems sort of silly. Oh, man, that is a response that's unfortunately straight out of the big tobacco playbook. And by the way, for anybody who has never heard of PCBs before, prenatal exposure impairs brain development in fetuses and young children. So that is uh, very serious on its own, much less when you uh, consider it with everything else going on here. Doug, is there a right way to farm, sa uh, farm salmon? And if so, what is the difference between that and the wrong way? Well, you know, I should start out with this really fascinating quote from a Chilean expert named Wolfram Heiss, who said, there's no right way to do the wrong thing. <laughs> so there are people who believe that caging salmon, that raising salmon in a farm-like atmosphere is always wrong. But I think that the world needs the protein that comes from salmon. The world needs effective, clean, responsible, sustainable aquaculture across a wide range of species. And so when it comes to farming salmon, there is an alternative new technology that's coming up. It's called recirculated, recirculating aquaculture systems, RAS. And RAS is used in land-based farms. They have huge tanks in which they put these salmon, the salmon swim in water that is filtered through ultraviolet filters and biofilters. So it filters out all the pathogens, all the viruses, all the diseases. So the land-based farms don't need to use chemicals to raise their fish. So they're producing something that's healthier for us to eat. These salmon never ever touch the ocean. And so they don't escape and breed, interbreed with wild salmon. They don't spread disease to wild salmon. And many of the best of these farms are recirculating all of their, all of their water. They're, they're, there's just very little spillage in the best of them. And they're using the solid waste that the filters pull out of the salmon tanks as fertilizer. Some, in some cases, they're burning it as biofuel as plants. You know, this is a, a, an, a new technology. There are about 80 projects worldwide underway to raise salmon this way. We're lucky here in Nova Scotia, where we live, to have two very good ones that have been producing farm-raised salmon 
for three or four years and it's all we eat. It's the only salmon that we eat and we don't eat it very much even, um, but there's a big one down in Florida called Atlantic Sapphire outside Miami, which is a weird place to raise the cold water fish, but it's the biggest one in the world and its products are pretty widely available. You know, so this this is a, this is a start, and we expect that by 2030, probably 20 to 25 percent of the market for farm salmon will be land-based salmon, which is much healthier for the environment and for the people eating it. Well, that's a very encouraging piece of info. Go ahead, Catherine. One of the also one of the really interesting projects is in a strange place in the Midwest, and it's a, a company called Superior Fresh. Um, they have managed to uh, connect salmon farming, or they managed to convince the salmon to live its whole life in fresh water. And they managed to connect the salmon farm with a hydroponic facility. So while they are raising salmon, they're using the wastewater to fertilize uh, growing leafy greens. And so there's this wonderful relationship going on there. And they're close to market, which helps to reduce the carbon footprint for people in the Midwest. And if I'm remembering correctly, that company is located in Wisconsin. Now, it's not often, but I occasionally do see salmon at the grocery store in the seafood department that is marked as being wild caught. Catherine, are the checks and balances in place that ensures that this claim can be trustworthy? No, they're, they're not in place. I mean, there's no clear definition of, of organic or sustainable. If it's wild oh. caught Pacific salmon, it's wild caught. But farmed salmon, 90% of the salmon we consume today is farmed Atlantic salmon. And most of that salmon, except for a very small amount, is raised in open net salmon farms on the ocean. And one of the things we found, Trey, in our research was a nonprofit um, advocacy group called Oceana has done sur a couple of surveys nationwide in the US and found that often what's sold as wild caught salmon is in fact farm salmon that has been purposely mislabeled because it costs more to buy wild salmon as, as anybody knows and as it should but you know you can you Alaska has a well-managed wild salmon fishery wild pacific salmon there is no useful well-managed fishery for Atlantic salmon so if it says Atlantic salmon it's farmed for sure but often the labels, as it is with ignoring the how it's raised, where it's raised, chemical content, they just they there's there's no government strict government regulation on this kind of labeling. Omega threes are a positive health benefit that salmon possess. They uh, uh, help with the risk of coronary heart disease, lower blood blood pressure, potentially improve neurological function, and reduce inflammation. Doug, are there similar levels of omega-3s in wild and farmed salmon? And if not, why not? Well, there, there have, it's interesting. One of, the, one of the physicians we talked to is a guy named Leonardo Trasande, who's a professor at NYU in New York. He has a medical degree from Harvard, a public health degree from Harvard, an environmental medicine degree from Harvard, and he's an expert in the impact of toxins on children. And he's very concerned about the buildup of PCBs and other contaminants in salmon. And he says that the, the, the problem here is for some people, pregnant women, children, and infants, the benefits from omega-3 in salmon are outweighed by the risks from these contaminants, which affect the brains of, of maturing children and fetuses. And so he wants you to avoid that. And what we've seen also is that in the farm salmon, the level of omega-3s has been dropping over the last few years. And that's one of the benefits, got a lot of omega-3 fatty acids, but they're dropping because the, the, the farm salmon get those omega-3s from forage fish, from these wild fish Kathy was talking about earlier that are scooped up by trawlers. Those fish have become far, far more expensive because the demand for farm salmon has gone up globally. And so they're more expensive. So the industry has been looking for alternatives and they've looked for vegetables. Go ahead. Well, initially they, they tried feeding these fish veggies, but salmon are carnivores. Um, they didn't like the veggies. Um, and that had a negative impact on the quality of the fish. More recently, they've been looking for other sources of protein, 
it, it, you don't have to eat another fish, but you have to eat the same protein. And you can get that protein from surprising sources. There, there are two projects on, on the East Coast. One, it uses algal oil uh, uh, in order to create that protein. And, my, uh, and then another one that uses the larva from black soldier fly to uh, create the protein that the salmon like. And they also use this, this in, uh, you know, pet food uses wild fish and fish oil. Um, so they can also sell this to the pet food industry and help take the pressure off the, the uh, wild pelagic fish in other, in other bodies of water. You know, Trey, my favorite moment in reporting this book, we were, we were talking to a lawyer who, who was really a good guy, strong vegan, but still a good guy. And <laughs> talking with him about, about finding alternative protein sources, as Kathy's just described. So we stop raping the oceans off of the west coast of Africa and Peru. And we, Kathy described the black soldier fly larva being used in this experimental plant here in Nova Scotia. And the lawyer said, in all seriousness, I wonder if those soldier flies need a lawyer. And we laughed and we laughed. And that was unfortunately the last time we talked to him. <laughs> you know, so there are, there are militant people who, who, as Wolfram High says, there's no right way to do the wrong thing. And they can look for places like, why, I think it's called Wild Type in San Francisco, which is an outfit that's growing salmon from cells. We found some of those experiments going on here where you grow them from cells. And that may be, that may be the future. But for now, the future for farm-raised salmon should be on land. Get them out of the water, get them away from wild salmon, and raise them in tanks on land. I completely agreed with that. Uh, one more question, Catherine, on what these farmed salmon are fed. Why do salmon farmers add dye to these chemical pellets that they're feeding their fish? Well, everybody likes a pink salmon. <laughs> in the wild, they eat krill, which give, it has a chemical in it, which gives the flesh a pink flavor, a pink tinge. And in order to create a similar a salmon, a similar a salmon that looks like a wild salmon, they have to feed it this this. It's a, a, it's a synthetic dye. It's a synthetic dye, and it turns the flesh pink. And the interesting thing about salmon is after they spawn, they turn gray anyway. They taste the same, pink or gray but it's more appealing if it's pink. And they've gone so far in the industry to oh, yes. create what they call a Salmo fan, which is, if you know, you go to the paint store and you see paint, paint chips you know, on a, on a piece of cardboard and you can look at all kinds of different hues. Well, you can do that also and determine the color you want your salmon to be. And, and what they found is consumers really like them, kind of pink to red. That is insane. Oh, man. Uh, so one of the interesting things that I read in this book is that the U.S. actually imports 90 percent of the seafood consumed in this country. As far as salmon is concerned, the four largest suppliers of salmon in the world are Norway, Chile, Scotland and Canada. Catherine, why did the Canadian government create the Cohen Commission in 2009 and how did their investigation play out? Can you answer that? I'm going to have to answer that one. Sure, no, sure. The Cohen Commission was, was part of my remit in the research here. The Cohen Commission was created after the runs of sockeye salmon at, the, at a particularly important river in British Columbia called the Fraser River had gone from an expected 1 million to about 10,000. And that kept dropping over the years. And there are a lot of salmon farms around that river. And so the Cohen Commission was set up to discover what was killing off, what was stopping the returns of these wild sockeye salmons. And the Cohen Commission spent two years taking testimony, and it didn't find a smoking gun. But what they did find was some interaction between the pathogens and diseases coming from the salmon farms, how they were affecting the wild sockeye salmon runs. Unfortunately, like a lot of other commissions in almost every other country, very little was done in response to the Cohen Commission. That's really sad. And Doug, who is Dr. Christy Miles Sanders as some as evidence that the Canadian government was actually proactively dashing evidence of the dangers that salmon farms pose to the wild salmon population? 
Yeah, Dr. Miller Saunders is a, Can a scientist with the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans out in British Columbia, and she's spent most of her career studying salmon, and she found signs of virals, of viruses in farmed salmon for the first time, this particular virus called PRV, and she published a paper that was going to be published in Science Magazine of all places, and she got permission from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to speak to the press about it. But then a few days before the publication, DFO told her, no, you can't speak. They muzzled her and they stopped, tried to suppress that science. And they were working very closely with the fishing industry. And, and she was one of the witnesses at the Cohen Commission. And she talked about having her science suppressed. And it fits with that very same pattern that we found after the 2004 study was published in Science Magazine, where the industry pushes back hard. They use false science and they use paid scientists to discredit. And the governments, not only here in Canada, but also in Maine, one of the few places in the US where they're still raising farmed Atlantic salmon and open net pens, you know, they, they are more interested in protecting the few low, low paying jobs associated with this industry than they are in protecting the public health and the public environment. Catherine, relatively speaking, does Norway do a good job of protecting its wild salmon? It's doing a better job today than, it, than they were in the 1970s. And you see that uh, in terms of the, the amount they're charging for these leases. Leases in Norway are some of the most expensive in the world, if not the most expensive, to in order to put a, an open net farm on the ocean. Uh, in contrast, they give the leases for free for those willing to build on land. In addition, they have a, a red light, green light system in order to gauge and or monitor sea lice and other diseases. And if you start to experience those outbreaks at your farms in Norway, they reduce the amount of salmon you can raise, which of course affects your bottom line. So yes, Norway is making an effort. And as I said before, that's the reason the, there are those companies are looking for friendlier environments in which to do their work. The problem here is though that Norwegian salmon may be raised a little better, but if you're buying it in Austin or any place else in the US or outside Norway, it's come here on an airplane. And the carbon footprint of that is enormous. And Norway has done a lot also of sort of semi-questionable things to protect its industry. Exporting salmon for Norway is the second largest exporting item after oil. And so they, they've taken steps to protect that industry. They've encouraged people to eat more salmon when some of their own studies have showed that there are dangers from this salmon. And we, we talked to a woman who's out, lives in California now, an American scientist who went to work in Norway and she blew the whistle on some of these efforts and she lost her job and she lost her work permit. And so she had to come home, you know, so that Norway, Norway is better, but it's still dominated by these multinational companies that are all over the world. Was that Claudette uh, Bethune? Yes. Just yes. reference yes. there. Yeah. That's a, a very sad story for sure. Doug, is man-made trash a problem at many of these open net salmon farms seen through litter carelessly being disposed of in the areas where these companies are located? Well, it, <laughs> it, it, it sure as heck is, Trey. Um, we, we took a trip up to the southern coast of Newfoundland um, where there are a large number of salmon farms. They've been, the government there has encouraged them, they subsidized them, and so you've got dozens and dozens of them along the coast. And, and a, a very gracious man named Mel Jackman took us on a boat tour of Hermitage Bay, which is this beautiful, beautiful bay. It's, it should have been pristine there. It's got wonderful mountains. It looks like a fjord in Norway. And he took us around and showed us the debris around these put out by these fish farms. We went to one beach where we were knee deep in trash from the fish farms and it was huge. And you know, people can go onto our website, which is www.salmonwarsbook.com and take the virtual tour and they can see what Mel showed us there and see this trash. And the, the aquaculture companies, they don't clean it up. The government doesn't make them clean it up. 
It's just trash that's there. And that's salmonwarsbook.com? Yes, sir. Okay, great. I'll uh, make sure to include links to that in the show notes. Now, this book is broken up into three parts. Part one is Big Fish Eat Little Fish. Part two is In the Trenches. A good chunk of part two is spent detailing environmental disasters caused by salmon farms that are on par with the Exxon Valdez and the Deepwater Horizon disaster. What happened at a Cook Aquaculture salmon farm in Secret Harbor on Cypress Island in mid-2017? That was, that was one of those turning points for the salmon industry on the west coast of the United States. In August of 2017, a woman named Jill Davenport and her husband Jeff and their two kids were out in their boat in Puget Sound. They were going past Cypress Island where there were three huge salmon farms and they heard a lot of strange noises and chains rattling and they looked and one of these farms was in the midst of collapsing. And in fact, over a period of about 24 hours, this entire salmon farm collapsed. More than 250,000 salmon, alien Atlantic salmon, were released into the waters of the Pacific salmon. And the state of Washington investigated this. They found that the owners of that farm, Cook Aquaculture from New Brunswick, Canada, had been negligent in maintaining the farms. These farms have nets that hang down to keep the fish in, and they have protective nets, a second row to keep out predators. And these nets were covered with mollusks and seaweed, and they had become not nets to, prep, to let water through, but they'd become sails, and they pushed these salmon cages until they all broke loose from their moorings and collapsed. And it was a monumental environmental disaster. And in response, the Washington State Legislature passed a law banning open net salmon farms in their waters. And that ban is in existence today. There are still attempts to, to use those farms for native fish in the Pacific, South, uh, Pacific Northwest. And we would prefer they didn't do that and a decision is expected soon. But that was a colossal disaster and it had a strong impact. Now let's switch to the East Coast of Canada and go back to Newfoundland for a minute where in 2019, just two years later, Maui, the Norwegian firm that is the dominant salmon farmer in the world, lost nearly 3 million salmon across 10 of its farms in a single incident. Nearly 3 million dead salmon. The photos of them pumping these sa this salmon flesh, these huge salvage ships out of the, out of the, the cages is, is, is gross and heartbreaking. And, and yet the, Norwe the, the Newfoundland government took basically no action. And in fact, the Newfoundland government is now on the verge of opening up more and more of its coastland to these open net salmon farms. They should be going the other direction, but they're not. Mm. Part three is titled The Next War. Though much of this book is forced to deal with the negative, there are reasons for optimism. Doug, how does the Miramichi River provide a glimmer of hope for folks? It's, it's, a, it's a great positive story, and we do have some positive stories in that, in that third, third section of the book, Trey. The Miramichi has been a historic and famous salmon fishing river in Canada, in Canada. Ted Williams, the American hero Hall of Fame baseball player, had a salmon camp there. The Hershey family from Pennsylvania had a salmon camp there. You know, it was, it drew anglers from all around the world, but over the last three or four decades, the salmon population had dwindled to almost nothing. And so, What's happened there is the Atlantic Salmon Federation, a nonprofit group, and other community organizations have gotten together to restore that river. They've created places, they've used carefully placed boulders to create resting places in cool water for the salmon. They've tried to push away, push back the habitat destruction that was going on there. And it's a positive sign. They're, they're, they're having salmon come back, small numbers still. But, in, but they are coming back. And we saw a similar and perhaps larger effort down in Maine in the Penobscot River and Penobscot Bay, where again, the Nature Conservancy and other community groups got together. They bought two dams from uh, an electric company and they tore them down to open up 
the river for salmon migration. And you've seen again, the numbers coming back slowly, slowly, but at least it's headed in the right direction. Okay, and last question here, because this book obviously, it details something that is very serious and it is uh, really tearing down some myths about something that is consumed widely in this country and around the world. Uh, were you all concerned at all when starting this project that you would receive a lot of pushback from the industry, uh, from the corporate press, from others who uh, don't necessarily want uh, this sort of information to be out there for the public, Catherine? Well, we, we tried very hard to reach out to the major players, uh, the major in industrial players, and no one would speak with us. We tried telephoning, we tried sending letters and emails, and they decided that we were, based on our questions, that they were not going to get a fair shake. Well, that's not true. We, were, we always cover all sides of a subject. And we tried very hard to present the, their, their point of view, the business side, through uh, SEC filings, lawsuits, press coverage, and interviews they'd already given. So we hope that their, their thoughts are out there, but it doesn't stand up to every, all the other research that we, um, that we found and the studies. And, the, and, and one of the most important things is that people say that consumers are not concerned about this. But it's not true. There's been a recent study by the Environmental Defense Fund of uh, 800 or so Americans. And as a consumer, you can take this fight right to the industry. If you're political, you can take it to your, your government, your regulators. But you also, as a consumer, have a lot of power. You should go into your fishmonger or your market and you say, where is this fish from? How was it raised? How was it harvested? And if you don't buy it, the industry will adapt. And the, this uh, study that they did the numbers are very clear. 69% of those surveyed by the Environmental Defense Fund said that they were concerned about their origin of their seafood. And 73% said they would eat more seafood if the consumer protections were strengthened. And 71% said they would eat more seafood if environmental standards for fish farms were raised and that the fish came from sustainable sources. So that consumers are willing to take the time and spend the money to eat well and to eat sustainably. But let me add one thing as far as the pushback. We expect the industry to attack us, but our last book was about how the CIA messed up efforts to stop nuclear proliferation. And they went through our trash after that book came out. So I think, I think we, can, we, can, we can take this. We knew what we were doing. We know what we're up against because we've seen their history of going after critics. And we've tried to write a book that is 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 important and has an impact on consumers. Well, kudos to you both on this one. They are Douglas France and Catherine Collins. Their newest book is Salmon Wars, The Dark Underbelly of Our Favorite Fish. You can find out more information and buy the book through salmonwarsbook.com. Thank you both so much for the time today, and thank you for this crucial, important book. I think when it's all said and done, a lot of people will be enlightened on this subject, despite the best efforts of uh, those powers that be. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much for a great interview, Trey. Really appreciate it. Thank you to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to Joshua Bates for the video editing. If you have any video editing needs, hit them up on Instagram at Forager Digital. And thanks as always to you for checking us out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at booksonpod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.